This time two years ago, thousands of Texans had the same question. What will state leaders do to make sure we don't go without power or water for days in another weather emergency? Yeah, it's been more than two years since the February 2021 winter storm that wreaked havoc on Texas and contributed to the deaths of hundreds of people. And in this case, that explains. We look at what action has been taken since then and how an idea that's being considered right now would change the Texas energy market. After the snow and the ice of February 2021 had melted and power and water service had finally been restored, catastrophe turned to criticism. How could a state known for energy production get so dangerously close, just four minutes and 37 seconds away from a massive grid collapse that could have wiped out power in Texas for months? Lawmakers went to work. That legislative session in Austin, there were 185 bills filed related to the February freeze. In the end, two main pieces of legislation were signed into law, Senate Bill 2 and Senate Bill 3. So what SB 2 did was essentially change the governance of ERCOT. ERCOT's board is no longer self-selecting or self-perpetuating, like, like many corporate boards would be. And it's appointed by a commission or a group appointed by the governor and the legislature. SB 3 had two big parts. One was this requirement for energy producers and transmission utilities and natural gas producers to weatherize their equipment. So a lot of people talked about that in the immediate aftermath that they needed to prepare, you know, their actual physical structures better against extreme cold. But the legislation didn't specify how to weatherize. That was left up to the Public Utility Commission to decide for electricity providers and the Texas Railroad Commission to decide for natural gas generators. But SB 3 was very vague in how this was going to be implemented. In fact, it was so vague that the Railroad Commission really didn't do anything until there was a, a huge public outcry. In August of 2022, the Railroad Commission laid out its weatherization requirements, although still somewhat vague. Things like correct failures that occurred during previous weather emergencies, install equipment to mitigate weather-related operational risks, and do internal inspection and self-assessment to protect critical components. Starting this year, electricity providers have to meet the weatherization rules created by the Public Utility Commission. Some of those rules include maintaining freeze protection equipment and making sure additional fuel supplies are stored and available during a winter weather emergency. The PUC plan has requirements for summer heat as well, but weatherization was only part of SB3. And the other big piece of this was to try to make the grid stronger in times when wind and solar energy weren't running um, you know very strong like if the sun has set or the wind's not blowing so that's what legislators this session are really focusing on and there's a big idea in front of legislators right now one that the public utility commission unanimously approved but wants lawmakers to weigh in on before it goes any further it's something called the performance credit mechanism this plan is super controversial this plan is is untried, untested, unproven, never been done before. Here's how it's supposed to work. Power providers like CPS Energy could buy credits from power generators. Those generators would sell those credits on the promise that power providers can cash them in for extra power when it's needed most, like during extreme weather. The PUC chairman has said two things. One is that it could increase capacity so maybe more plants would be built. And in fact, there are power generators who have said they're gonna build more gas plants if this goes into effect. But it also would incentivize kind of these older plants to stay around a little longer. It would create a new revenue stream to boost power capacity in Texas. So why can't power generators just increase capacity now? Texas only pays the generators when they actually are producing electricity. Texas is an electricity only market. Power generators only get paid for the power they're providing, not what they could provide. The coal-fired plants, the natural gas plants, they're not in the game 
year in, year out, day in, day out. And so if you're if you have to build a plant to operate for all of August, but you're only going to get revenue in August, it doesn't pay off. Hers believes fossil fuel generators need to be paid more to provide more. It's what's called dispatchable energy, meaning it can be turned on fast. But he argues this credit idea is flawed. The companies know that if if they accept the money today and don't show up with the electricity tomorrow, they have a very easy way out. They can just simply file bankruptcy. Federal bankruptcy court trumps the Public Utility Commission and ERCOT every time. But the Public Utility Commission, which is overseeing this effort, has said there's going to be a penalty. Um, the problem is we don't know yet what that penalty is going to be because it hasn't been decided. Environmental advocates are concerned the credit plan would encourage building more fossil fuel plants. Renewable energy production like wind and solar is certainly growing in Texas, but the technology to store that kind of power isn't widely available yet. But for them to take the reins today, the renewable fleet, the wind and solar fleet needs to be two, three or four times as large as it is. Over the next five to 10 years, we need to keep the coal and natural gas plants available to run. When we need that power, we desperately need it. So what does CPS Energy think of this credit idea? That's one of several questions that I asked the head of CPS two years after that awful winter storm. Our job is to make sure that never happens again, which is why the state figuring out this policy is so important. This will help us ensure that that year never happens again. Here's another big question. What could this mean for your utility bill? More of that interview and the answer when Case That Explains continues next. Case that explains is diving into a big idea that lawmakers are weighing right now in the aftermath of the 2021 freeze. It's a credit plan. Yeah, power providers could buy credits from power generators and cash them in when extra power is needed, like during a weather emergency. I sat down with Rudy Garza, the president and CEO of CPS Energy, to get his take on this plan and, yes, to talk about cost. I think it was always meant to be a framework uh, and a starting point for a conversation. If it fails to incentivize new generation, then it probably has fallen short uh, of what the goal is. If it goes forward the way the PUC has laid it out, what would that mean for CPS Energy? We want to make sure that a couple of things. Number one, that our generation remains part of that mix uh, and, and has value in, in a new market. Uh, design and that it doesn't overly penalize renewables. Right now, we need every megawatt of power that we can get our hands on, uh, and our, our approach is balanced. We, we've got fossil fuels, we continue to maintain generation capacity, but we're also investing uh, heavily in solar. It also has to be affordable. There's going to be one key question for everybody, right? And what does that mean for what I pay CPS energy, what I pay for power? So if more generation is the answer, is that somehow equal a higher price for energy at the end of the day? Ultimately, there will be cost implications for every customer. Uh, and I think most customers would tell you that they're willing to pay for, uh, you know, for reliability to the extent that it's in question, right? I mean, what would you have paid for power back when we were in winter storm Uri? I don't expect the average San Antonian to understand that their bill is going to go up 10% or 15% in the future. Our job as, as, as the energy expert in San Antonio is to make sure whatever that incremental difference is, is a marginal, reasonable cost that ensures reliability. If it ensures reliability and it doesn't break your, you know, the bank to get there, then I think we've reached a balanced approach. But you know, th there is no solution that, that is a free solution for customers. Now Garza said that he believes CPS Energy is better today than it was two years ago, and they've made some changes after that winter storm. We talked about a lot more than we could show you right here, so you can watch that full interview within the This Explained story at KSAT.com. In fact, you can watch all of our stories in their entirety on demand by scanning this QR code. Check them out on the KSAT Plus app as well or the KSAT YouTube page. We'll be right back. Happily, we're talking about energy today because massive winter storm systems marching across the country, leaving devastation behind at least nine tornado reports across Oklahoma and Kansas. Most of the tornadoes 
touching down in Oklahoma yesterday near the Oklahoma City area. Neighborhoods battered. A Jeep seen flipped onto the driveway of another home. Families waking up to survey the destruction of strong winds once expected to start in April. Apparently tornado seasons now here in February. It was like a blizzard inside the house with all the debris flying. And I was screaming for my kids, you know, because they were in their bedrooms. <laughs> I didn't know if they were hurt or anything. Now this is all connected to the same sweeping storm system that brought rare blizzard warnings to the mountains of Southern California earlier in the weekend. And that same system is now heading east. Yeah, so much of the country seemed to be dealing with effects from that system. We talked about that dust earlier out in the Lubbock area. Didn't make it here, and we're dealing with spring-like temperatures, Adam. Yeah, you know, it'd be nice to be able to cash in on some of that rain that, and moisture that's associated with it. And of course, I don't miss the dust at all or even the severe weather, but... We need the moisture, we need the rain, and there is another cold front headed our way. It looks like most of the energy is going to be north of us. Warm through Thursday, cooler by Friday through the weekend, and becoming very windy. Some very high wind gusts with that next cold front. As for our rain chances, that's just at 10%, and that's going to be Thursday night. Little bit higher hope east of town, Lavaca County, DeWitt County. Uh, maybe even Gonzales County, but you know, for the most part, we're not looking at much in terms of rain with that next system. Sunny and dry across Texas right now. Of course, there's the massive system moving through the Great Lakes region and now headed toward New England with it. The blue indicating the snow on the cold side. What we're watching is this counterclockwise swirl coming on shore in Washington State and Oregon and of course pulling moisture on shore into California. High ele elevation snow, lower elevation rain, more moisture in the western U.S. and they're still pulling out of a drought so I know it can be too much of a good thing in a short period of time. Overall, I think it's beneficial and a good thing for them. Here's that dip in the upper level flow. That's our next system trough. It's going to slowly drop southward with it, spreading snow across the Rockies. Good for the ski resorts. They've had a pretty good season, even in the southern Rockies, down into Arizona and northern New Mexico. Another hit of heavy snow for them. As for us, the energy with this and the moisture is likely to stay just to the north. So notice Thursday 9 a.m. Some shower activity just north of San Antonio. We get into Thursday night, most of it Oklahoma, Arkansas, even Missouri and East Texas as well. East Texas, by the way, not in a drought and not even considered abnormally dry. I did mention some of our eastern counties have slightly better hope for some showers and the future cast is indicating that a little bit as well. The main headline, though, with this cold front will be the wind gusts starting by about 5, 6 p.m. on Thursday. So we have a few more days. This is not tomorrow. This is Thursday late in the day. Winds could very well gust in excess of 50 miles per hour at times. And our future cast is indicating that, especially just west and northwest of San Antonio. So it's one of those Thursday nights. It's one of those situations where if it's your trash or recycling on Friday morning, you may want to wait to the last minute Friday morning to get your bin out and then pull it in as quickly as you can thereafter. Let's talk temps 87 our high temperature today. That's 17 degrees above average and just three degrees shy of the record set back in 1918. Currently 81 in Carrizo Springs, 86 in Hondo, 77 in Kerrville. Not bad out there, especially with the very low humidity and dry air dew points in the 20s and 30s right now. But let's fast forward to tomorrow morning. Most of us low to mid 50s. 54 in San Antonio, 53 Poteet, 51 in Seguin and Bernie, Bulverde, about 51 degrees. By noon, we're already up to 80, so warming up quickly tomorrow. Nothing but sunshine, 87 then the high. In a wind, it's going to be light and variable at about 5 to 10 miles per hour, but turning southeasterly tomorrow afternoon, and that'll increase our humidity a bit. It's temperatures, though, still way up there, well into the 80s. 89 Port SA on the west side, 87 officially in San Antonio is what we're expecting. And more of the same Wednesday and Thursday, just some morning fog both of those days with noticeable humidity. That is until that next cold front hits Thursday evening. And by this time on Thursday, we're going to be talking about the wind. I can promise you that. Ooh, all right. Thank you, Adam. Up next, the buzz. <laughs>
To the buzz, and actor Will Smith has won his first award since last year's infamous Oscar slap. Smith took home the trophy for his role in emancipation at the 54th annual NAACP Image Awards on Saturday. Smith not present to accept the honor in person. He also produced that historical drama that debuted on Apple TV Plus in October. Other winners at Saturday's award show include Keita Brunson, Viola Davis, and Angela Bassett, who won Entertainer of the Year. Living World War II veterans, they are a rare gem these days, which may be one of the reasons that a community in Augusta County, Virginia, felt it was so important to honor 98-year-old Emerson Pell. Pell served in the U.S. Navy as an aviation machinist mate, third class. Friends, family members, even the volunteer fire department here honored him with a parade at his home yesterday. That's great. Pell said the most cherished things in his life have been his loving family and his 64 four year marriage That is amazing. Yeah. All right. Calling all Pokemon trainers. It's Pokemon Day and the company <laughs> is celebrating with a slew of announcements. The company marking the day by announcing the re-release of the original cards. The company also unveiling trailers for a new Netflix show and a game called Pokemon Sleep. Yeah, this is interesting. That game will track how users snooze and let them catch Pokemon with similar styles. Okay, so we all were told to get off the couch a couple of years ago to go catch them all, but now yeah. we're just catching Z's. I don't Our know if that's sleep? how it works. I don't know. I, I don't know. February 27th is the anniversary of when Pokemon first came out back in the 90s. The month of love, it is coming to an end with the delicious heart-shaped sweetness of strawberries. It is National Strawberry Day. The sweet fruit grows all around the world, almost year-round. Ancient Romans believed that strawberries had medicinal purposes. They actually prescribed them for sore throats, for fever, even for depression. And despite their name, strawberries are actually part of the rose family. Mm. Did you know that? I did not know that. Yeah, might explain their fragrant scent and bright color. A very interesting fact there. Well, we'll be right back. I got a boo <laughs> from Cassie. High temperature trend tomorrow, 87 along with Wednesday by Thursday. We're even a few degrees warmer. Wouldn't shock me if we hit 90 degrees here in town. But then the bottom falls out a bit by Friday, back into the lower 70s for highs, and we'll have mornings in the 40s then. And looking ahead, really get ready for the wind Thursday evening and Thursday night. All right, thank you, Adam, and thank you for watching the News at 6. See you back here on the Night Beat at 10. Have a great night.